Welcome back, Briley. How about now? Can we heard you at the beginning and then you cut out. Yeah, I heard you and then you, then you dropped. <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> Testing. I see little green things over my head. Can you people hear me? <laughs> I can. We can hear you. Oh, thank goodness. Okay. I will breathe now. Thank you. I think there's a single space up there. You stand in it. You wipe out your sound.
we'll get started in just a moment, everyone. Kind of making some last minute adjustments. Well, it's just after one o'clock SLT. I think we can get started now. Um, so hello, everyone, and welcome to VWEC's Expert Series. I'm Breda Janviev, and today we'll be presenting the best show and tell ever with David Arjuna's 3D Brain Exhibit. And before we begin, please note that our presentation today will be recorded and uploaded onto YouTube. In fact, I believe it is being live streamed on YouTube as we speak. We ask that you please turn off your mic during the presentation until we open it up to our Q&A session. And thank you, Spiff, for putting that in chat. Uh, the, the live stream is in chat right now. So a link to the regular YouTube channel for VWEC is also about to go into chat. As soon as I paste it. <laughs> when you check out YouTube, be sure to subscribe to the VWEC channel to be notified of all the excellent content that is continually being added there. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest, who's not sitting next to me right now, is he? I think he's coming right back. I see him. Do I see him? We'll give him a second. And there he is. This is David Ajuna, who is also Dr. David Hubbard. Dr. Hubbard is a research neurologist specializing in fMRI of concussion and meditation. He has a BA in philosophy from Yale, an MA in counseling psychology from Stanford, an MD from the University of Connecticut, and neurology from Einstein Montefiore. He came into Second Life in order to build a brain like a planetarium for neuroscience education, and that is exactly what he's done. It is currently located at Whole Brain Health Sim. But today, I believe he is bringing it to us. So fingers crossed that that all works out. And welcome to VWEC, David, whenever you're ready. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. OK. Hello. Wow, it's nice. To, I recognize a whole lot of you after uh, almost nine or 10 years since this first began. I came here in two, uh, 2015. Actually, a couple of my graduate students came here at first and met uh, Evan Soulstar. Uh, we did it. Uh, we did one of those uh, birthday celebration conferences they have every year, Linden, whatever it was called. And then we came to Wisdom Site. What 2016 or so? I think Wisdom is not about right. Something like that. Okay. Well, so I'm going to. Uh, my agenda is to talk about how it came about to have to be trying to build a brain for educational uses in Second Life. So I'm actually going to start with this little drawing, this pencil drawing up here. So I'm going to show you four or five slides, and then I'm going to uh, I hope ask you to come to the brain itself, the, uh, the full model, which the plan is to have it right here. Uh, but worst case, we can have it where it is and teleport to it. But we'll get there when we get to it. So uh, this this little drawing is very faded because it is in pencil. And I found this just recently, and I drew this when I was 10 or 11 years old. And I find it quite fascinating. I have not actually looked at it in a long time. I, I don't want to spend really much time on it, except to say I've sort of been obsessed with the brain and trying to figure out how it works and how to model it since apparently age 10. Let's see. Did I do that? So the slide just disappeared. Huh. 
Okay, that's good. I believe you can push the green triangle top right. To go to another slide, yes. Uh, okay, so I just I want to take a minute looking at this because it somewhat fascinates me and it fits in with where we're going here. Right in the middle of this 10-year-old's idea of a brain is the word good is two boxes, good and bad. It sort of interested me, interests me that to an adolescent, good and bad is sort of where the center of the brain is. The very top, there are some hammers. When I was a kid, there were uh, an ad for Alka-Seltzer, and the, the, the ad had hammers banging on the, the uh, person's head. Well, I am not doing that, uh, so this is the next slide. Let's see if I can go back. Uh, and then I'm just going to note in the very back are the letters PB, which I, I know are the initials of my, uh, my next door neighbor and best friend, Peter Burling, for about 10 or 15 years. So I thought this was interesting, and I have been kind of pursuing this ever since. That was age 10 or 11. I had three sisters, and then I got acne. I got bad acne when I was about 11 years old. And it really, uh, it, was, it was a very unpleasant thing. I realized I was going to have to find a solution to not being able to survive by being handsome or the best uh, athlete. And so that's when I uh, discovered this lady. Do any of you recognize who this is? Test your microphones, too. That's Ann Rand. So Anne Rand, of course, has a terrible reputation now, but when I was 13 years old, and the book had fairly recently come out, uh, she was the first person who gave me the idea that you could have ideas. It didn't occur to me before that. I thought that was looking in the mirror and running faster than the other kids and trying to get along, and the idea that you could have ideas and have thoughts and have meaning and beliefs that really kind of woke me up at age 13 or 14. And that pretty much sent me on the track to first philosophy and then uh, psychology and then uh, medicine. And so what I'm basically going to do is sort of use these various models of the brain to get us to the final model, which is the one we're going to go look at in a few minutes. So this is sort of the 17, uh, 1600s view of how the brain worked. And it's not so much what's interesting about the actual names that they thought were important back then, such as cautiousness. I think that was kind of an interesting one. But the general idea was that it was a little bit like a muscle, so that the, the important things would get bigger. As, you, as if, you, if you were strengthening your muscles, the muscles would get bigger. So therefore, if you were strengthening certain kind of brain qualities, that region would get bigger. It would push out against the skull, and you could feel it. You could put your hands on people's heads and, and know uh, what, they, uh, what, what areas they were well exercised in. Uh, but that, of course, uh, didn't last long. And this is kind of the current view. So Elon Musk, he is sure, not only is he going to get to Mars and do a whole lot of great things, he's also going to solve uh, the whole mind-brain problem. And so he already has a device where he can put 11, uh, a thousand electrodes underneath the skull, lying on the actual wrinkles of the cortex. And he believes that with enough of these little tiny electrodes, uh, he is going to be able to uh, do interface with the, with the brain, do everything the brain can do. Uh, and so we're, this whole idea, uh, which initially was called parallel distributed processing, but now really is a synonymous with the term artificial intelligence. The basic idea of these brain models is that pretty much every neuron connects with every other neuron, and that then it's all probabilistic, that basically through learning and through comparing and uh, connections with these, all these different brain areas, that's what happens. Stuff comes in, it all gets analyzed in a parallelly distributed manner at nanosecond rates, 100 trillion synapses, it, it, it all comes out. And I, I think the appeal to this model is that it's super fast, it's unconscious, it's 
by definition, can make every possible connection that's possible to make, and therefore, of course, it's going to be able to be to have all the answers and to be uh, the smartest possible thing. So that is kind of the current situation in neuroscience: is that it's it's a, uh, a massively fast uh, computing system, but that isn't actually what the anatomy is. The anatomy is Broadman area. So these Broadman areas were determined back in the 1700s. Broadman was a neuroanatomist. And basically what he showed is the, the cortex had approximately 50 different patterns to it. So the cortex is the thin, uh, rumpled part on the top above the white matter. And it's where all the, uh, the organization of the complex cells are packed. And there are 50 different patterns in terms of the way these, uh, wh what those cells look like and how they're connected together. And over the, over the, uh, the 200 years since, each of these have different functions. So just looking at the one you see in the front, you can see some numbers. In the middle at the top is a pale blue one called, that says 17. That's Broadman area 17. I'm gonna go back and look at that area in a minute. So what I want to do now is I want us to go into the brain and see these Broadman areas as if it's a planetarium. So we're going to sit uh, right in the middle of this brain and look outwards at these Broadman areas. And then I want to go into more detail and give you a little tour of them, how they work, a couple of diseases like seizures and stroke and, uh, and dementia, and then come back here and talk some more. So how's that sound for a plan? And then we have to decide, are we going to bring the brain here or, or TP to it? In fact, we can't TP to it because I think I just took it. Shall I try to just uh, res it here? You sure can. You're going to need to accept the um, group tag so that you can res it. Okay. I think I did accept it, so I should also wear it? Uh, yes, please. All right. What's it called? BWEC management. I can resend it if let's, you're. Let's see if this is the one. No, that's partner. Right. Let's see. Let me make sure I said that right. <laughs> you did send it to me, I think. Yes, BWEC management. I'll send it one more time. There okay. you go. And then shall I try to res it on that uh, that big deck out there? Uh, let's try, yes. Let me go walk over and kind of give you some sense of where Brandon tried to put it, and it worked right. great. Um, kind of right out here, and then we'll pull it up in the sky. How's that? Okay, now I, I, so I'm going to just put it right at your feet and hope for the best. Okay, my fingers are crossed. Everybody duck. <laughs> oh, it did go in the air. That's perfect. I, think I believe we're still on the same parcel because I can hear you both. Yes. And um, you guys should see it. It's right above the slideshow. All right. So we didn't, it looks like I did not res the, uh, the, the uh, oval, the black oval around it. Uh, so we won't be able to see it as well, but uh, I think it'll work. So let's see, is there the, uh, the teleport inside it? Let's see. Don't see it, David.
also don't have a floor, so we can't actually land in it. I think the best thing I should try to do is see if I can re res it where it was and teleport it there. If it's phantom, we could fly into it and just be floating in it. That, okay, we can try that. Where I am, we are inside it. That might be a fun little, uh, you know, adventure. Get your, come fly to where I am. I'm going to try to get myself on top of the amygdala. Maybe we should be afraid of our situation. Okay, if everyone would like to stand up and fly up and back, we should be able to, to get right in there. It is phantom, so we should be able to fly right into the brain. Let me know if anyone needs any assistance. Good job, everyone. So now I'm going to fly upwards because I'm going to fly up to the motor strip. So the motor strip, these neurons up here, way up at the very top of the brain, some of these motor strips, uh, some, some of these neurons are two or three feet long. They go all the way from here down through the brain, down through the brain, through the brain stem, through the spinal cord, where they synapse and go out to the spinal cord. So these go, these are really long. In the, in the giraffe, they're even longer, of course. These are where those neurons start from. So I'm not going to go back down again. I'll show you addiction. So basically, the structure you're looking at now, sort of having to follow me around, but I am now in the basal ganglia. So gentle heron and I are in the basal ganglia. What we're looking at are two sides of the three different parts of the basal ganglia, the putamen, the globus pallidus, and the, uh, the dopamine system is. So this system is the dopamine system. This system's job is to move us, is to motivate us. If this system wasn't here, we would not move unless something was dangerous. It's this system that says, I want you to move forward. I want you to seek food. I want you to seek, uh, seek uh, to be to explore. Uh, and, and the opposite is the real problem, which is if one is not getting what one needs or wants, that's what withdrawal is. So withdrawal is that very unpleasant sensation that one gets when one is not getting uh, what what the uh, the system thinks that body. 
this is the hippocampus uh, on either side. So this is also a subcortical structure. Wisdom is right between the two hippocampi. I'm going to move myself over there too. So this, this is the structure we always think about when we are talking about uh, memory. So in fact, this huge structure is also uh, old cortex. It's not uh, neocortex. Uh, and so really when we say memory, it's actually place memory or spatial memory. It doesn't hold our memories of what we see or what we hear. It holds a very accurate memory of where exactly we are including our orientation, up, down, sideways, and our perspective. Are we looking at the lake from, from the shore, or is our vision, vision of that memory looking from a boat toward the shore? All of that is handled in this structure here. I'm going to come back to it because I'm going to show you what Alzheimer's plaques look like because Alzheimer's plaques occur in the hippocampus. Okay, so now I'm going to sort of challenge myself. So this is what I am working on now, is, uh, is how memory and, and remembering and seeing work. So I'm bringing you back now to the visual cortex. So I am between the two sides of the visual cortex. Uh, this is a good one to really fly around a little bit. If you go way up and then look down at the brain, you can just see how huge this visual cortex is. It goes from the back of the brain and kind of wraps around the back of the brain. So what I've done to make the, the point of this is, is I put onto, actually Galen, uh, with Fran's help, put onto these, this mesh. So this is a mesh from an actual MRI scan in, uh, in, in the Netherlands, University of Maastricht in the Netherlands. We imported actual MRI scans format that's called DICOM for, de for medical imaging, and then uh, Galen used Blender to transfer them into Second Life objects. And so these are actual real Brodmann areas, and this is the visual cortex, which is a very intense uh, mesh, so we made it a little more legible. So if you can look closely, what you're going to see is snow. So on that, are we have attached textures of snowy scenes. And I want you to see if you can actually see that, because I'm, I'm going to make a point about how seeing and memory works. So this is the part of the brain that sees. If we were standing uh, in a snowy environment and looking out at it, uh, it the, that scene would come in our eyes, it would relay through our thalamus, and then it would, it would hit the middle layer of the sensory cortex, so-called layer 4-5 or... Five, or uh, uh, the, the mid-layer cortex, I didn't do that, but let's see. Uh, let me put it way back. And maybe I didn't turn this around. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show what happens when we have a memory. So if we were standing on this snowy uh, situation and looking out at it, this part of our cortex would be all covered with this activity, we would be seeing it in the present moment. But now we're going to leave that situation. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show, okay, now we're somewhere else. Now we're in another place. So now what I'm showing is that same structure, only if you look closely, it's a fall scene. Those are the, the brown and oranges of fall foliage. Uh, and so the idea is that this is what we would be seeing if we went to that same place in the fall. That same part of our brain would be activating, but it would be a different memory. So in a sense, this is the fall memory. And if we were having, uh, if we were thinking, if we were either in the winter scene or if we were remembering being in that winter scene, then we would be having the other memory. We would be having the memory of the winter scene. And so that is what I'm trying to kind of communicate with this, uh, with this way of looking at it. So now I want to just show, so I've given you a sense of anatomy, and now I want to talk about a few illnesses uh, to give you a sense of why anatomy is not all that matters. 
So the first thing I'm going to do is show you uh, what Alzheimer's looks like. So, so not quite right. So that actually is a, a, a histology of an Alzheimer's plaque. So it, it, for some reason, it's sort of a not quite the right color. But the, the idea is I'm able to sh put onto these brain structures what the actual histology under the microscope would look like. Uh, so that's what this actually is. I can, I can put any, any sort of histological microscopic uh, texture uh -huh. attached to these structures to show that idea. So now I'm going to show you an example of, uh, of seizures. So what, is, what, what would a seizure look like? Let's see if I can get this right. Yay! Okay, this is Fran's res uh, modeling of a, of a seizure. So the, the, what, what this shows us is that uh, seizures arise in one location. I'm still going off too quickly. But they arise in one location and then they spread out across the brain in all directions. So that's, I'm using a, a particle system to try to demonstrate that that brain disease, which is that pattern. So, for instance, now I'm going to show you a stroke pattern. Let's see if I can get that one right. <laughs> now, I'm not sure that's quite what I want to say. Oh, there we go. So, this is meant to be showing uh, emboli coming up, say, from the heart or from some other part of the uh, Some vascular system. I saw them for a moment, but now I'm not seeing them again. So this is this is a work in progress on how to make uh, how to make this this brain be useful uh, to show uh, other things besides just being out. David, there was a question. I'm pretty curious okay, about this so myself. Dee Dee was asking. Can, go ahead and oh. take questions, and also we can do it from back in the uh, at the other site if you want. Yes. To you, whichever you would prefer. Fine, this is fine. Well, the question was about the seizure, and they were asking if the seizure always sort of starts in that same location and spreads out from there. What a great question. So uh, that's exactly right. So a seizure, uh, a seizure starts from wherever the scar tissue is. So in this particular example, which I will see, see if I can show again, just for fun, I had it coming out of the, the middle of the brain, so it could go out in all different directions. The most common locations are actually rather rather in the middle of the brain, the so-called medial temporal lobe. But anywhere there's a scar tissue can be the source of a seizure. scanning uh, nearby chat or whatever to see if I can answer anything else here or else we can go back uh, to the to the sitting area people will get get seasick in here sorry we don't have the the, the, uh, the, the dome around it oh hi Fran hi Fran uh, well I, I uh, I think we're done. I, 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 I tried to just take it myself, and I didn't take the whole thing. I just took the brain. I know. It, it, it's totally my fault I didn't make it here in time. I could, I could, do the, I could show the dome if you want to show that. Now. I don't think we need to now. I think why don't we, why don't we uh, sit down and see if there's any more questions. All right. Thanks, Brown. All right. See if I can right get then, myself back to, to the seat. <laughs> exactly. Let's head back to the seating area and we can address any questions y'all may have. Really, you were sitting, you're right on top of the Alzheimer's plaques now. So uh, maybe Fran got that working for us. 
So that's a more accurate color. Those are the hippocampus on either side of you and me, Bella. And then the, uh, that's a more accurate color of what the Alzheimer's <laughs> plaques look like if you were looking at them under a microscope. Now I'm heading back. All right, so we're hopefully all back in the seating area. In just a moment, I will hit give everybody a landmark to where the permanent exhibit is, is located in the whole brain health uh, sim. So we'll have that in just a moment for you. But this would be a great chance if you have any questions about the model or about brain anatomy, neuroanatomy, let's have it. And Ram. I think the message that I try to communicate is that this idea that the brain is just a computer is really misleading. And even the ones who talk about it that way, the actual physicists and neuroscientists, et cetera, they really don't mean it quite that way. So I think, I think the point that's important to make is we are not unconscious nanosystem computations, calculating probabilities, and making us do stuff. That's not how our brain works. We actually experience uh, reality. So that visual cortex example I was trying to show you up there is, that's actually hitting our cortex. That's not uh, computation. That's the direct stimulation of those cortical cells in response to the uh, reciprocal, the, uh, peripheral receptors coming in from the outside. We are not living in a hallucination. That's kind of a popular uh, uh, YouTube topic these days. And I wanted to make the, the point about my troubled childhood that since age 10, I've been sort of obsessed with this stuff. Ellie has a question. Would you like to ask your question in voice? Well, sure, but uh, go ahead and ans ask Wisdom Seeker. Wisdom Seeker asks, what does meditation do in the brain? Because mine's going to be a little off topic. Uh, so let's answer that one first. Okay, I actually don't see that. Uh, so what is med meditation? Uh, let's see. Meditation quiets the brain. I think there's still, after all these years, there's still pretty much agreement on that. Now, the question then becomes, what does quiet the brain mean? And so it doesn't necessarily mean uh, empty of activity. So there typically is a, uh, when one is meditating, there typically is a, an alpha rhythm. So that's a resting state pattern. But basically, it's not thinking. Meditation is either using a mantra or some other method either focus uh, or, or try to not focus so that you are having less thinking activity. That's what meditation is. <clears throat> so it, it would be a quieter brain, but not, not a silent brain. Okay, I'm reading yours, Max. Yeah, uh, Max, there's a new this is this disorder that's being talked about now called aphantasia, which is getting a lot of attention, and no one's really quite sure what it is. But it seems to be it doesn't quite fit. But there's a wide range of these kind of variations, and this is a group that seems to be uh, able to experience everything normally, but then their memories are no longer in color. So even though they see everything normally. They don't remember it in color, and there's every possible wide, wide range to how that happens. Uh, and so, let's see, what is it you're specifically verbal language? So, you know, I mean, we, should, we have to ask ourselves, what is language, of course? And uh, uh, I think a, 
a smart way. Chomsky, of course, said language was innate to our brain structure. And that really, he just couldn't make the case for how that happens. It makes more sense to think of language as essentially a very special kind of, uh, to think of uh, a special kind of memory. It's memory without, uh, without the specific memories of how we learned it. I don't remember where I learned the letter A, but at some point in my life I did learn it, and now all of those letters we can use, all of those symbols we can use, without having to be tied to whatever the, the initial memory was that we once had. <clears throat> so basically that's what we mean by thinking. We're talking about the use of language. We hear them in our head, so that's what thinking is. It's listening to the little fragments of words that are going through. Use, I think most people, would those would be auditory words going through our minds. I think some people think they also have them as, as seen words. So basically we have what we have, what we see now, what is going on now. We have our memories of such experiences that we've had in the past. And then we have the words we use to analyze those memories and those experiences and try to come up with new ones. And we do that sometimes being afraid through our amygdala and sometimes being driven, driven through our basal ganglia dopamine systems. And that's us. Any other questions out there? Well, I was going to take us a little different direction, and I have to just say, David, this is so incredibly interesting. Um, thank you for all the information. I've been to your presentations before, and um, this is just such an interesting topic, and I don't want to get everybody sidetracked from it, but I kind of wanted to go a different direction and ask you about why you chose Second Life, um, how this, um, how the build manifested. Um, I know you, Fran has helped you a lot. I'm happy for Fran to jump in because actually there's probably a lot of people sitting here who who are educators who want to teach something and your model is spectacular um when i've actually worked with folks at my med school and they've talked about the power of walking through something to learn it versus just seeing pictures of it or even a brain that's laying on a table that you're dissecting so could you talk about why you chose to build it yeah that is that is a, a very fun topic i have been sort of trying to build brains as you, since I was 10. But also, as I went through medical school, I also found it very helpful to, to try to build something, to kind of put things together and maybe have a wire that goes to a, from a thalamus to a, to a cortex so I can visualize it that way. <clears throat> and so with the cortex, it's particularly a challenge because it, uh, to look at it as a two-dimensional structure, you just cannot get a, get a feeling for how big those structures are and how they relate together. So I said, okay, there ought to be a way to do it. I knew that MRIs have a, a definite uh, uh, image suffix it's called a DICOM image. And so it seemed like it ought to be possible to be able to, con to import the DICOM images from real MRIs into Second Life. So I found a university, uh, University of Maastricht in Netherlands, who was able to do that. It was a company I'd worked with before, Brain Voyager, at the university that actually made uh, made structures for fMRI research. And then I found Galen through Wisdom and Fran. I think uh, I needed someone who knew uh, Blender. Blender or Bender, I never get it straight, uh, to convert those three-dimensional uh, images into Second Life images. And that was a major project that took a long time, but now they're there. So those, those 50 Brahmin areas are in a script file, uh, and so I can open them up anywhere 
and they're all linked together in, in, the, in the proper location that they were in when they were in the brain. Uh, and so what I did next is for each one of those, I, I put labels on it, I put tags on it, I attach a little text as to what that structure did. So that text is in the local chat. It turned out it kind of drove people nuts to have it taking over the local chat, so we don't use that part of it anymore. And then I also put together the, uh, the slideshow that would go with each of the brain areas. Uh, and then the, the trick was to how to get inside it and uh, make it be an experience on the inside. And so that's when we started having it on the inside. And people like that. People like going inside, seeing it from the inside out. So about how long, do you mind, did, did it take you guys? Uh, it sounds like you had a, a team of at least three. Uh, there was some Blender knowledge needed, but I'm, I mean, I see hover text and I, I heard you talk about scripting. So there, are, these are basic virtual world tools that you've just managed to use um, so nicely. About how yeah, long that's do you That's a good think? way of looking at it, yeah. So when you first come to Second Life, uh, so how did I pick Second Life? Well, there, I, there was one other alternative that my son knew about uh, that seemed to be more of a building objects, uh, building buildings or something. You probably know what it is. Uh, that was back in 2015. So it, it seemed as if this was going to be the obvious place to do it. Of course, when you first joined, it took me weeks just to walk, just to go in a straight line. Uh, I think it almost took me six months before I could even get basically around. The next thing I did is I, I went to that uh, Builder's Brewery, I think. Uh, there are places where people love to, love to build stuff, and, and, uh, and uh, some of them, depending on how big a project, you can pay them to do it, but things are very cheap in Second Life, it seems to me. Uh, so I fiddled around with that. Uh, uh, my... I, got together with a German uh, woman, Biru, who, who knew more about it than I did. So we were able to kind of scrap together pieces of it, but it wasn't really until we found Galen at Whole Brain Health that we started getting uh, the team together that could do the whole thing. And that's so it's been since 2015, really. I think there's a great takeaway there regarding um, having a vision for, for sort of an interactive exhibit as opposed to like I like to create you know 16th century buildings and and artifacts from from that period uh, but it does take more than just hey I know what it should look like I have to also know how it moves and if it makes a sound and you also you really need a team to to come on and, and help you with the scripting and with the audio and with everything else that goes with that in order to make that fully immersive experience Looks like Fran has added uh, his part in that, though I'm sure it's bigger than just a few sentences. <laughs> Would yes, you like to uh, talk about right. that? Fran did all the scripting. That's right. So Galen brought the uh, brought the the DICOMs from uh, from the real world into Second Life, and and Fran did all the scripting for all the different parts. It's linking them all together, uh, the menus, uh, all all these all the pieces. Well, a few minutes ago, I um, handed out to everybody the landmark to go to the original um, structure. And did David, you didn't take that down, did you, to bring that over here? Did I you? I think I did. Okay. I think I took it down. I, I, I just took it. I I, uh, I know how to I know how to hit the take button. That's one of the buttons I've learned. <laughs> okay. Um, then maybe at some point soon, if you guys want to go visit that, you certainly can. You know, 
hang on to that landmark. Give David a little time and his team to to put that back together so that you can visit it. It's very cool inside the black dome that he has it in because unlike here with the black background you can see all of the different components much better you can also see all the little text areas that have been included there uh, so that you can see the different parts of the brain in action a brain hat yes you know you need to make a brain hat a souvenir brain hat i think would be excellent have one we're gonna, I'm gonna give it to you right now. <laughs> Bren is offering to, to res a copy of the brain. Um, what would you think of that, Ellie? Could we, is that something we could do? Oh yeah, he's all set up to do that. Um, David, do you okay. wanna take yours? And then he could res the one with the black around and it might be a little easier for people to see. Oh, uh, Fran, and also we're going to need something back there because I took the one there. So I uh, can I have you make it? I, I'm going to get rid of the one there now, here now, and then will you also put one back at, uh, yeah, just, at Whole Brain Health? So I'm going to. Yes, I just. Second. I don't I just see the brain. Did Fran take I just it? Sent, I just sent it back to you, David. Okay, thanks, Fran. Yep, I'm sorry. Uh, find, find the one that I had. Nice. <laughs> That's what it was supposed to look like. So. Yeah, nice. I love that. Oh. Death minute. Star. Wait a minute. Why didn't the. Okay. That's there no moon. Nice. <laughs> oh, that looks great. You can you can see the snow in the visual cortex at the back. Oh, the slides work too. Excellent. It's good though. All all of us educators get to see the traumas of of putting these things together and getting them all to work. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> I threatened Brilo with that. With uh, bringing my carousel of thirty-five millimeter slides, <laughs> so I've heard rumors of, of projectors and carousel slides like that. I've I've never actually seen this sort of technology. It's completely foreign to me. She said sarcastically. Uh, I hear you. I see you, Serenity. Go ahead, ask your question. Serenity is asking how easy it is to damage the brain. For instance, you said that seizures begin at the site of scar tissue. Does that mean that seizures due to, say, low blood sugar are causing enough damage to the brain to cause scar tissue? Wow, great, great questions. Okay. Uh, I've been on the phone with my nephew, who is a uh, soccer player in Chile on one of the lower level teams, and he was knocked unconscious and had no, uh, no memory for an hour before and three hours after, and then was very dizzy and couldn't really do anything, barely even walk for two weeks. So it's always really scary. So we were WhatsApping each other once or twice a day for two weeks while he was down in, in Chile. So uh, usually when we bang our heads, we are twisting our brain stems. The top of the spinal cord is the brain stem. That's where uh, uh, our vegetative uh, functions are. Uh, including the sleep-wake cycle. So if you twist that structure, it becomes a little bit swollen, and that's what causes a concussion. That's what a concussion is. 
So in general, because it's only swelling and it's only a twisting of that structure, uh, in general, people recover. So it's not the concussion that's really what the worry is. The worry is that the brain, the brain up above the, uh, the brain stem, that's getting damaged. So that's what got figured out with football is that it wasn't so much the concussion itself. It was the severe trauma to the brain cortex causing some bleeding uh, along the edges of the brain as well as the twisting of the brain stem that caused the concussion. So that kind of really confused things. It wasn't the concussion that was really causing, it was horrible for the person at the moment, but it was the trauma to the brain. So then how does the brain get traumatized? And it really gets traumatized pretty much the way you can imagine a bruise on your skin. It's going to have blood coming into it. It's, the blood's gonna dry up. It's gonna be a bruise. It's going to be swelling. In general, that will recover. But sometimes, just like skin, if you've banged yourself hard enough, that tissue can be scarred. So that's what trauma is. That's the kind of the trauma that one gets with, 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 a, with an accident, which of course is, uh, and so some of those will have scar tissue, and then some of that scar tissue will cause seizures. One can also be born with a little bit of scar tissue, so there are congenital seizures as well. And then once there's a little area of seizure, that area is electrically less stable, and if it uh, if that if that starts to uh, to accelerate, then the electrical uh, signal can spread across the whole brain, and when that happens, all the neurons that go, are passed by that spreading of electricity are going to fire. So that's why you get uh, in the movies you'll see the person whose all four extremities are shaking. That's because the electrical activity is going everywhere in the brain. And among other places it goes, it goes through the brain stem. So that's why people in general are unconscious during seizures. If you only had a seizure of your right hand only, so only the, sc the scar tissue was only in the area of your right hand, then your right hand would shake, but you would not be unconscious. Once the spread of the, sh of the seizure goes across the midline, if that means it's going on both sides, which means it's going through the brainstem, so that's why you get unconscious. So m when we think of seizures, we think of the person being unconscious, though it doesn't, they don't have to be unconscious. Uh, the scarring doesn't interrupt normal transmission per se. So uh, for instance, there are types of brain tumors that just push the brain out of the way. They, they are essentially scar tissue themselves, they grow, the brain just moves out of the way. They never actually interfere with any of the neurons uh, of the brain. Uh, and then there are the type that are invasive and they can, they can uh, go in amongst the normal brain cells and cause damage. So, so really uh, both, both, both ways are possible. The two most common illnesses that we uh, think about are Parkinson's and, and Alzheimer's. Parkinson is a gradual loss of dopamine from the cells that make dopamine. Dopamine is the system that makes our movements be moving toward a certain direction. So there's a kind of a, a, that, a motivation component to the movements. And then in, uh, in, uh, Alzheimer's is the hippocampus, the part of the brain that helps us uh, store and retrieve memories gets uh, damage gets damage to it in the form of amyloid which is a protein that accumulates and causes what's called a plaque it's not technically a scar tissue but it's like a scar tissue so the most common brain damage would probably be alzheimer's or de or dementia It's a good slide down there. Can you see the brain from where you are? I'm sort of zoomed in on the brain inside. Those are pretty good slides there. Should we call it a day? We can. I do have a few closing remarks to make. If anyone thinks of a question, this would be a good time to get those in. 
So our next VWEC expert series continues February 24th at the same time, 1 p.m. SLT with Brent Knudsen, who will discuss how to integrate virtual world learning experiences into your curriculum. And you can find this in all scheduled events at the VWEC Events Plaza calendar, which is just over yonder, <laughs> and also in local chat, which I am putting in right now. And as a reminder, YouTube uh, for WVEC, our channel can be found at this local webs or this website that I'm also putting in local chat. And finally, oh, don't forget to subscribe to that channel because it's becoming quite a resource. And finally, if you're interested in presenting at the VWEC Plaza, like Dr. Hubbard has today, uh, we have a form that you can fill out online and I will put a link to that also in local chat. And that's about all I have. Does anyone want to slip in a question real quick before we call it a day?